same time, the Greek scientist Democritus had quite a different idea. He argued that there was a limit to how small you could make something. If you smashed a piece of rock, sooner or later you would end up with a bit you could not break up any more. So Democritus believed all matter was made of tiny particles that couldn't be split up or destroyed. The Greek for unsplittable is atomos, from which we get the word atom. Of course, these were only arguments. There was no way of doing an experiment to see who was right. It took more than 2,000 years before this scientist, John Dalton, put forward a theory based on experiments. It was published in a book about chemistry. The only way he could explain his results was if he imagined each of these elements to be made up of small, indivisible particles. He called them atoms after Democritus and used these wooden spheres to explain his theory to other scientists of the day. By 1900, scientists were investigating the effect of trying to pass electricity through air trapped in a tube. They found that when most of the air was pumped out, a glow developed inside. This effect could only be explained if the atom was thought of as being made up of several particles, instead of the one single particle suggested by Dalton. This led the Cambridge scientist J.J. Thomson to investigate the effect further. From similar experiments done in his own specially designed tubes, he confirmed the existence of smaller particles inside the atom. He pictured the structure of the atom to be more like a current bun, the smaller particles being like the currents embedded within it. These smaller particles were called electrons. Although this was a useful model, it was quickly replaced by a better one, put forward by Thomson's student, Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford was experimenting with the newly discovered alpha particles known to come from radioactive substances. Alpha particles can be detected by a Geiger counter. Rutherford was trying to find out what happens when a very thin sheet of gold foil is placed in the path of the alpha particles. To his surprise, many of the alpha particles pass straight through it. What was even more surprising was that some of the alpha particles were deflected by the gold atoms, most by small angles. some by quite large angles. It's not what you'd expect if you imagined a gold atom to be completely solid like a current bun. But what if you thought of an atom more as empty space with a small solid bit right at the centre? This would explain what was happening in the experiment. so the gold atoms could hardly be the solid atom Thomson had imagined. The results of this experiment led Rutherford and scientist Niels Bohr to come up with a new atomic model. They concluded the atom was largely empty space with a tiny nucleus at its centre. In the outer regions were electrons orbiting round the nucleus. Atoms of different elements had different numbers of electrons and a different sized nucleus. This model has since been replaced by another as a result of more observations. Instead of picturing the electrons keeping to fixed orbits around the nucleus, we now imagine them to be more in a swarm. In yet another model, the electrons are believed to behave more like waves than tiny particles. 
And what about the nucleus? We now know that is not one single particle. It's made up of two groups of different particles, protons and neutrons. We've come a long way from Dalton's early model, which pictured the atom as a solid, indivisible particle. There's nothing wrong with this model. It will still explain a lot of things about the way atoms behave. But it won't explain everything that other models will. Scientists invent models to try and make more sense of the world. Some are physical, like this. Others are more mathematical. They're helpful in making predictions. Who knows, in 10 years' time, many of today's models will probably be overtaken by better ones. Nothing stays the same forever.